going to put that in there because, in part because it kind of reflects that what I'm going to talk to you about is a more of a general discussion about something that we don't really know about. It's kind of a, a bit of a known unknown. And for that reason, uh, it's not going to be a terribly precise talk. It's just going to touch on a number of bits of evidence which are quite suggestive. And when you put it together, they perhaps um, will make you reflect on some of the things that may be going on that relate to smoke mortality in the sea that we need to think about, particularly uh, as to what happens in one river may not be the same thing that happens in another river. So, yes, I'll be the one who mentions it. And that's local adaptation. Now, that's the sum total of my table of contents, because the rest of it I couldn't figure out how to actually put it into a coherent statement of, of what it would be. Local adaptation, well, it's been around since Charles Darwin. It's really at the heart of evolutionary theory, and evolutionary theory is at the heart of biology and most of what we do and understand as biologists. So you can describe it in different ways, but local adaptation is something that promotes fitness and therefore promotes survival and reproductive success. You can look at it another way, it's genetic variation that's correlated with fitness. That's a bit more technical, but what it means is adjusting the genetics of populations of organisms in order to increase their fitness and therefore their abundance ultimately. Now, you can see it, a very obvious example of that at a species level here with the difference between a lion and a polar bear. They're adapted to different environments and those are genetic differences. Where it's more difficult to see it is when you look within so-called species. And what adaptation is, is uh, this is from a paper by Carlos Garcia de Lianis and, and we helped him out on. And basically what selection is trying to do is to adjust the genetics of the population in order to meet the changing environment to optimize uh, survival and reproductive success. But it's a little bit of a, a game chase because the environment's always changing and therefore you're playing catch up all the time. And depending upon how fast and how much the environment changes, the difference between where the population is genetically and the environment is, you have this degree of maladaptation for the environment that would be possible if everything was static and could evolve to some stable equilibrium. So, at the key heart of it is something that I've talked about many, many, many times over the years, and that is the structuring of salmon into populations. And it's pretty well now accepted that we have uh, salmon are structured into these breeding populations, and these breeding populations are different in different rivers, and that within rivers we basically have multiple genetically distinct breeding populations. And there's increasing evidence that these populations will be adaptively different to some degree or another. Well, are they adaptively different when it comes to smolts? Now, I'm going to show you an extreme here, and I like to put this up because it kind of puts things into perspective in Scotland. Here's an example of adaptational differences within Atlantic salmon, within a river in Newfoundland, where you have two sympatric populations of Atlantic salmon that are very, very different. And it's called Little Gull Lake, and I'm going to go like this, and in there you have a resident population and you have an anadromous population and you can angle for them and catch them one after another, but they don't interbreed at all. Why doesn't the resident stock not go to sea like the anadromous one does? It's because they're adaptationally different. And what you also find is here you can see the, uh, this red uh, portion of the pie. That represents these resident populations. The only place you find them is in Little Gull Lake itself and in this little lake up here. <coughs> this resident population, even as juveniles and fry, don't go into rivers. They actually breed in the lake itself. But the anadromous population breeds in the river the smolts go into the lake. 60% of smolt production in Newfoundland comes from lakes. It's very, very different. But this is only one of the more obvious illustrations of the differences you get. 
And what we have here is, these are the different genetic types here that you get. And the genetic types for the anadromous fish, these are two enzyme loci. Uh, these are the ones you find predominantly in the anadromous fish. This is the one you find predominantly in the resident fish. They're genetically different. They occupy a different genotypic space. Now, how did we even get to that population in the first place? Because it's a very different life history strategy. Well, we're not quite sure, but the possibility is that before the Younger Dryas, the, the glaciations, Newfoundland was initially uh, glacial, and then the rivers opened up by anadromous salmon. They were colonized. Then you had some glacial cycles going on. You had environmental change. And probably if this was the anadromous, the adaptive peak, the genotype space that was associated with anadromous salmon, it actually just disappeared because the environment changed. And that was probably associated with either cutting off the population from going to the sea or from the fact that the sea became very, very cold and smolts couldn't survive once they were in the sea. So they stayed in the lakes and they evolved this resident form. Then afterwards, you basically got the environment changing back to where anadromous fish could survive. And you had a recolonization and you had this other population occupying the anadromous niche. And so you basically have this kind of adaptive landscape where you have multiple adaptive peaks going on. Okay, this is an obvious example. Do we have similar things happening, but less obviously within Scottish river systems or river systems elsewhere in the species range? Equally, when you get environmental change, you can have these, these niches evolving with time, and they can evolve in different, whoops, in different ways. Uh, you can have a shift. Oops. You can have the loss of, of certain niches. So you, these might be the niches before the change. These might be the niches afterwards. If there's a gradual transition, maybe the organisms can shift to these new niches. If there's a sudden change, they'll be lost. Equally, you can have just a gradual shift of a single niche, so the population goes from one form to another. This is just a sense of how the, the genotype and the environment might interact and how you might get changes, and how, equally how this might differ from one river to another river. Just think about whatever traits there might be. Now here's an example of, uh, of a more subtle uh, adaptive difference. This is a study we did quite some time ago on the shin system, and we looked at the um, oops, uh, the effect of acid water on egg survival. And what we find here is that this is the percentage of egg mortality. This is the environment they were put in, four different river systems, two different stocks. What you see here is if you put the shin stock in the oikel, you get very high levels of mortality because the shin stock is, not, is susceptible to acid effects on the eggshells whereas the oikel stock, the native stock, isn't. So this is an adaptive difference. This is just one trait. Think of how many traits stocks might potentially different, differ in. So with respect to smolts, what might be the traits that they're different with regard to? Now, as we've heard earlier, particularly from Andy, uh, um, smoltification is a complex set of physiological processes. There's lots of things going on at a biochemical level, a physiological level, a behavioral level. All of these could be variously differentiated amongst populations. And these may well have implications for how they're affected by environmental change. But each one probably will be finely adjusted for the environment in which the organism or the, the population finds itself. Oops. So, temperature as we've heard earlier as well, is one of the key factors, but it's probably only one of the factors. But let's just focus on that for a moment and see uh, how it might be relevant. So, there's lots of papers out there, basically, that show the importance of temperature, and this was again mentioned this morning. I've just put a couple of them here. Uh, water temperature, primary influence on timing of seaward migration. That's 2011, there's, you know, this even goes back a lot further. 
We also know that if you look at it on a broad geographical scale, the temperature is associated with the arrival of smolts at the, at the mouth and entry into the sea. So again, temperature is quite important. What we are also finding is here is that the timing of entry of the sea is changing with climate change. But are all populations responding in the same way? Or is it just, is there just, all smolts are exactly the same, they all respond exactly the same to temperature. This was a study done uh, quite some time ago, over 10 years ago, by Davy Stewart, Alan Youngson, and Stuart Middlemas. Um, and it's the only one which actually looked at population differences with respect to smolt a small characteristic in terms of, in this case, small timing. And basically what we're seeing here is that the smolts from the upper tributaries, where it's colder, which should leave later, are actually, in fact, leaving earlier than the ones from the lower tributary. So what we have here is what's called a genotype environment interaction. And when you get that, it's very clear evidence that you have adaptive differentiation. It demonstrates you've got different populations. It also demonstrates that they're functionally different. And if smolt timing when they arrive at the sea is important, the question is, are they doing this so that they arrive at the same time at the, at, in the estuary so they can go out at the same time? Or are they, in fact, arriving at different times? Because arriving at different times may be important for whatever uh, whole is held in store for them in the marine environment. If they're going to the same place, maybe they want to go to the same uh, at the same time. If they're going to a different place, do they want to go at a different time? Here's a study that was uh, done more recently, Arne Jensen and his bunch in Norway, and they looked at a 22-year data set. Now, looking at it from an adaptive kind of perspective, the thing that interests me here is they plot, this is Atlantic salmon, this is brown trout, this is Arctic char. And this is the relationship between length and the day of the year. And they were mostly interested in seeing whether length changed with the, the time uh, of migration. But the interesting thing that's here is you'll notice that there's two groups of fish coming out of this system. And there isn't a particular relationship with length. If you put a 22-year data set together and you do get two bunches like that, that's certainly a strong suggestion that you've got two populations in that system that are behaving differently with regard to their migration timing. How much do we really understand about those differences of different stocks within a system and how important those differences might be? Then look at your river systems. Everybody tends to work on one river system and then you assume that it's, well, all river systems are more or less like that. But what we have is short rivers, we have long rivers, we have short rivers with lakes, we have long rivers with lakes, maybe one lake. Or if you're the nest system and you're in the upper Gary part of the nest, you could have to go through four lakes and one of the biggest lakes in, in, in the UK. Now, I find it hard to believe that the, the migration requirements and the, smolt, the, the character of the smolts is going to be the same in all those systems when those systems have multiple genetically distinct populations. Those, the smolts are going to have been altered by selection to maximize their ability to deal with the situation in each of those different environmental conditions. And if you look at the NES, What's required for smolting and being in the Kingi uh, tributary of the upper Gary, uh, 60 kilometers from the sea and five locks to go to get to the sea, is going to be different than the fish that are born and spawn in the lower nests in Inverness there itself. It's a very different requirement for being a smolt. So, this was done in 1978 by John Thorpe at the Freshwater Lab. He already started to look into this mechanics and, and was starting to look at what's involved with smoltification, what do fish do, and uh, trying to break down the behavioral and physiological mechanisms. And that's a lot of the work that's being done now started uh, 
back with John's stuff. Now, this is the talk that I'm going to give you later from Mitch Fleming, because Mitch Fleming unfortunately can't make it, but he's asked me to give his, his talk because I'm somewhat familiar with, with the work there. And this is really was the motivation for giving the talk that I'm giving now. And in the Allier system, which is six to eight hundred kilometers of river, these are smolts that have to go from John O'Groats to Land's End just to get out of the river. Now, equally, you can go up the, up the coast to the Berrydale, which is uh, 10, 15 kilometers long. You can't tell me that you need the same smolt in those two systems. You need a different smolt that does different things. In the Berrydale, you can have a smolt that just kind of goes, oh, I think I'll go to sea, and just floats down, and he'll be there within a day. He doesn't have to put any effort into it. He just needs to make sure that he uh, physiologically uh, can tolerate the salt water and ready to go. Now, if you actually look at the, uh, the Allier, um, you've, got three, you've got three types of, of behavior. You've got active downstream, passive downstream, and you've got even some active upstream behavior going on in these smolts. You've also got something that spans here about four months. Now, given your physiological smolt window that you can adapt to seawater lasts for, and Andy can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's somewhere in the matter of a few weeks. If you decide to become uh, s uh, adapted to seawater or able to be adapted at this point, by the time your window's closed, you haven't got anywhere near the sea. You're screwed. So you better get your coordinate your different components of your smoke migration behavior appropriate for the system that you're in. <coughs> and what is the combination that you need in terms of active passive migration um, in order to deal with a system that's got lakes or doesn't have lakes, it's got a short lake or a long lake or whatever. Now, if you, if you agree with the basic presumption of a certain degree of local adaptation, then how smolts in different systems respond to different perturbations of that system can potentially be quite different. So think about it. Long, short rivers, long rivers, lakes in rivers. What would you do different? What, what works in terms of active and passive migration? Uh, and when do you want to start your seawater adaptation, your physiological change to allow you to make that adjustment or not. How local is local adaptation? We heard this morning that uh, what happens in freshwater affects what happens in seawater. Is a river the locale of a salmon or is the locale of a salmon everything from the river all the way to its feeding area? Is its feeding area part of its local environment? And is the local environment for one population of salmon in the sea the same as the local environment for another? Well, there's some studies are starting to suggest that a lot of populations have specific migration pathways that differ between populations in, uh, in the ocean, where they go. I think that's another thing we need to reflect on. And the South Sea Merge project that Phil and Ken and I and, and others were involved with is starting to understand that populations may go to different places. And I'm just going to show you, uh, here's another thing to kind of reflect on. If you scale the migration challenges that different populations have, and here's just a few examples. Oops. Here's the Allier. This is the freshwater migration. That's the marine migration. We know that the Allier fish actually go all the way to Spitsbergen before they head off to West Greenland. So they, they go even further north. They do that in a matter of four months. They leave the river in April, and by the time September rolls around, there's fish already up in Spitsbergen. So that's the scale that you have there. there here's the the Asun River in Spain, very short freshwater migration, 
but a very long marine migration. The North Esk, short uh, freshwater migration, moderate marine migration. The Pornoy on the Kola Peninsula, uh, even shorter marine migration, because most of them probably stay up in the, the Barents Sea in that area. The Capacidlet River in West Greenland, yes, West Greenland does have a salmon river, it's small one. They probably just have to go just out to the end of fjord and, and that's where they, uh, you know, do their marine feeding. And the river's only 10 kilometers long. And so on. So how local is local adaptation? Well, here's a, here's a study we did as part of the South Sea project. This is a particle tracking model where we looked at actually if smolt started out in southern Europe, where would they end up if you took currents into account? And the interesting thing here that's, that's come out is generally they end up in the Norwegian Sea. Except there's one year here where there's an exception to that and where some of the fish actually end up going west. And that's because of the North Atlantic Oscillation being in a negative mode and you actually have a, more of a water movement and because of the wind, wind forcing that sends some of the smolts to the, to the west. Now, we were speculating at the time that those smolts might just end up dying or be lost or whatever, but we didn't know what happened to them. Well, we've recently um, just analyzed smolts from 1988 that I kept in the freezer and from one of the few post-smolt surveys uh, on the Labrador coast where they found quite a few fish. As it turns out, there are post-smolts from Europe in the North Labrador Sea in this sample, and not just one or two, but a significant number. And also, what it turns out is these post-smolts are from predominantly the Irish Sea, but there's a few from the east coast of uh, Scotland, the west coast of Scotland, and southern Norway as well. And the question is, are these ones that have been blown off course, or are these populations that actually deliberately want to go to the North Labrador Sea because that's how they've evolved their migrations? The interesting thing also is I just spoke to uh, Kiel Arne Mork a few days ago, and I said, can you tell me what the oceanic conditions were in 1988? And he said, yes, there was a negative North Atlantic Oscillation, exactly what was happening in 2008. So, is this what was happening and is this why some of the uh, European fish and the British fish have ended up on, in North Labrador? They were there as post-molts, they looked healthy. Will they come back? Were they successful? Is this a mortality factor? Is it not a mortality factor? Think about what the implications of, of these different migration capacities of different stocks in different types of rivers with different lengths of migration, whether they have lakes or not. What's the implication of putting a dam on there? If you're a stock that is used to uh, and adapted to migrating through lakes, a reservoir isn't going to make too much difference, potentially. But if you're a river like the Allier or the Spey or, or, or the, the Dee where uh, you haven't got lakes on them where you're migrating through and you put a dam on it, what's the consequences for smolts of that? They're going to be a very different response potentially. Stockings the same. On the, this is the Kyle of Sutherland system and I know historically they were taking smolts from below Loch Shin and they were stocking them up above the dam because the stocks up there had been diminished. But if this is a distinct population, and there's every reason to believe it is, then you're putting fish that have no experience of migrating through a loch into tributaries where they do just fine, and they go out and they don't know how to migrate through a loch. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why there's a very low smolt production or uh, smolt run coming through Shin Dam compared to the stocks that have been put in. This has implications for stock restoration as well, of course. Yes? Oh, it's a shin stock. We can stock it in the shin. Perhaps not. So basically what we're getting it back to is this general situation. And here we get environmental change. We've, we're in a period of increasing environmental change. We're in a period where we can expect this fitness differential to increase. 
Selection slowly adjusts things to cope with environmental change. Sometimes it can't deal with it in extremes. But this differential is probably going to be river stock specific as well as population specific within rivers to varying degrees. In some cases, they'll be more or less similar. similar. In other cases, they'll be very different in how they respond. We don't, we, we don't know. We don't have enough understanding to say, but it's very likely to be an important factor. So, honestly, yes, you probably prefer not to hear about the elephant in the room because it adds an incredible complexity. It means that single river studies are only telling you part of the story about what is going on. Thank you.